influence the kind of treatment. Thank you, Jamie. So, good morning to everyone. Uh, it's a it's a new approach with uh, these webinars, but I think you have to you have to do it. Uh, so, this will be um, let's say an introductory uh, webinar on preservation of digital geospatial records. Uh, uh, because as I saw from the list of attendees, uh, there are many people who uh, are from the archives, there are some people who are from the research community, uh, and uh, so we will cover the basics first to get the common denominator. So to introduce us all to the geospatial data and its role in organizations uh, uh, would help us <clears throat> to understand why do we need to preserve uh, geospatial data for the long term. So when do we need geodata? Uh, if you want to repair your roads and utilities, this is something that is uh, happening a lot, at least in our country, because the roads are empty, <clears throat> you need to know where they are and how many uh, roads you've already fixed. So you need geodata for that. If you want to buy or sell a house uh, or any real estate property, actually, you need geodata. You need to know where they are and uh, have the real estate records. Uh, if you want to plan your policies for uh, environmental policies, economic policies, or even education policies, you need to know where the impacts of your policies are taking place and uh, what are the results of those locations to actually manage. If you want to maximize your food production, it's always good to know what type of soil is there, what is the climate, uh, and also on the micro level, uh, farmers use yes to uh, dose the uh, fertilizer uh, to maximize their crops. So geodata is actually really present in a lot of places. If you want to transport your products, uh, if you have to optimize logistics, uh, you also need to know where the roads are and what the congestions there are. And of course, for any plans for the future, uh, you need to do work uh, in the location that you're planning for. And if you need to analyze the, the data from the past to actually plan for the future. And if we look at this, uh, we can see that 80% uh, of all data is related to a location. So geodata is actually connected to most of our lives, uh, to most of the transactions, to most of the operations we do uh, in our lives. But okay, let's get to the old archival geodata. So, of course, we need the most recent map to know where we're going, but to, we also need to have uh, the maps from the past to know where we were and to make decisions based on that. So the first thing that comes to mind is actually uh, land disputes. Of course, you need to know the, the legacy of the land, to, to know where the, the borders were, either be between uh, individuals, companies, or even between countries. Uh, if you want to protect uh, your infrastructure, you need to know where your underground infrastructure is so that when you're building, you do not destroy or damage it. Uh, in economy, uh, geodata is often used in uh, BI systems to predict future sales or to predict future trends uh, based on the previous results. But if you want to compare the previous results, you need to know the geodata, the, the boundaries of those areas uh, because they change through time. The statistical boundaries change, uh, the municipality regions change, and uh, if you compare the data for tables without the geodata, you will not get a good result. If you want to study the environmental impacts of, for instance, a mine, you need to have the old uh, information from the surrounding areas to see what was happening over there. And this is also where you need the old data to analyze the impacts of existing elements for planning the future. Now, to go to the more complex uh, solutions, like analyzing the multivariant economic impacts of new technologies like uh, internet or very popular uh, 5G now, uh, we would use an uh, AI or a deep learning technology to cal uh, calculate between different uh, variables. Uh, and this is also where you need geodata to, uh, to teach the machines so that they can know what the patterns in locations are. 
And of course, if you want to optimize the agricultural production, you need to know the results from the past to actually plan for the future and more, more, more. So we can boil this down to uh, the fact that the world's most valuable resource is no longer oil, but data. So we are slowly coming into a data-driven economy where the archives, the libraries, uh, will become the gold mines of the economy. And if you want to, uh, if you want to offer this data to our businesses who want to be competitive in the market, we need to make it in a way that it's uh, accessible, fast, readable, and uh, available. So let's see how do organizations use geodata. For instance, we all use web-based geomaps uh, like Google Maps to plan our routes. And did you know that in order for the Google Maps to actually predict the congestions on the road, they need to have a long historical <clears throat> time series of data uh, based on location uh, to actually give you a prediction. And of course, there are companies that use proprietary GIS systems, combining their data with the data of the mapping agencies of other uh, agencies or other uh, organizations. Uh, and a very popular business intelligence systems, as I showed before, use geodata as well uh, to plan their actions uh, to be more competitive and successful. Oh, good and of course, uh, the upcoming use of AI and machine learning uh, is now requiring the long time series of data to learn from it and to identify patterns that we would not be able to learn uh, or to, to, to predict uh, if we do it manually. So to give you an example of this, which is the greatest driver for geodata preservation, is how the geodata was used, for instance, uh, with an AI to predict uh, accidents. This is an example from an ESRI uh, user conference two years ago. ESRI is a company producing GS systems. Uh, so if we take that the specifics of AI and machine learning are that it identifies correlation patterns on a huge amount of data, uh, which would be impossible to manually analyze. Uh, so we can, uh, so we need a lot of data to learn from a longer time period. So in this case, what the use case actually shows us is that they use more than 10 different variables for traffic accidents, like temperature, wind speed, visibility, snow depth, uh, time of the day, road width, road alignment, speed limit, time directions, and so on and so on. And they use the seven years of data with more than 400,000 uh, accidents on more than half a million road segments uh, to analyze and predict when accidents, when and where accidents should happen. I mean, would happen. So this is a risk, a risk assessment map that was used based on location of those uh, uh, parameters. This is where the future of uh, decision-making lies, uh, learning from the past for the decisions of the future. Now, we show where geodata is used. Now, let's define what geodata actually is. So, uh, we want to describe something in space. We have local descriptions like uh, at the crossing of this and that street. We can have uh, like names of the cities, addresses, coordinates. And this all gives us some idea of where the location is. But geodata actually tells us about the geographical location, which is based on a geographical coordinate system, like the coordinates in the bottom here. Uh, the next question I often get is, what's the difference between spatial and geospatial data? And again, uh, spatial data is pertaining to mainly space, which defines shape, size of 3D models or building information systems, which is also a thing that we should archive in the future. But this is not the topic of this uh, specification. So geographical data is actually data that is pertaining to geography, uh, to larger uh, areas uh, where we use geographical coordinate systems to uh, identify objects for uses of deep learning. Uh, the next thing is how we model the world with geodata. One is by vector based data, which comprises of multiple coordinates, uh, uh, 
and based on raster data, which is a cell network, uh, a cell array that actually describes locations in space. This is important because it's a different approach to access and to store uh, these types of data. Uh, vector geodata is actually a combination of a geographic representation which can be... Uh, could I ask everyone to mute their... Yeah. Uh, geodata in vector form is mainly the graphical representation like uh, points, lines, or polygons combined with tabular data, databases, or uh, and added metadata describing the context. In order to use this to represent reality, we combine, uh, combine all those different layers representing objects in space, like roads, land use, hydrography, elevation, imagery, and so on, to create a model based on which we identify the patterns, we identify the relationships in space, and we see things that we wouldn't see uh, without uh, the locational component because uh, space is the common denominator to most data. So where do we get data, geodata? Basically, we used to use uh, field surveys to get to, uh, to capture the data. We used aerial and satellite imagery. Now more often we use LIDAR and drone technology. In the archival world, we also use scanning of old maps to get digital geodata and then digitizing them. Uh, and the, the new upcoming source of geodata is every person with a sensor in the phone. Uh, nowadays, uh, more and more uh, geodata is received by uh, analyzing the data from mobile operators, giving us locations of people in real time so that we can see uh, and track movements of people, which is also a very important thing now in this uh, pandemic. So these are different approaches that also create different uh, types of data that we need to take into account. So to come back to the um, way we use the data and why we should archive it, I think that the geodata from the past is the fuel for the location intelligence of the future. And to achieve this, we need to have standardized formats uh, to give them uh, and to, to the public in a machine readable access to an interoperable API uh, with additional comprehensive descriptions, uh, which is very useful in the European Union because uh, we have the Open Data Directive, which gives uh, data from the national uh, agencies and ministries uh, freely uh, to, to the to, to be used by the companies to produce new uh, results, uh, new ideas, uh, new uh, data-driven uh, products. So, in order, to, if if we do this, then we can expect a faster access to this data at the second beginning and drive the data-driven economy, uh, make it more competitive because we will have the advantages uh, of a faster access to uh, to data. I mean, you can see how things change if you increase the speed of the internet. Uh, how many more services are available? And uh, this would encourage new innovations and in giving us new products uh, if we all have the access to the accessible geodata. By the use of AI and the use of uh, uh, deep uh, learning and machine learning technology, we could actually answer answers to the impossible questions that we cannot even fathom today. So, in order to actually fulfill this need, we created the specifications uh, in the eARC project that are now uh, part of the eArchiving uh, building block. Uh, and uh, these specifications are a part of the whole eARC specifications package. Uh, if uh, you're not uh, familiar, so, so to start, we have a common uh, idea on how to package the archival digital information so that it is accessible in an interoperable way between different countries and organizations in Europe. Uh, this would help us increase the speed of communication, increase the uh, accessibility to this data and drive economy and uh, help us get more results in shorter time. Now, uh, 
the, the, the main idea is to have a common information package for all. But on the other hand, uh, uh, okay. Could someone stop the music? Can <laughs> everyone leave that mute? I mean, I get the... <laughs> okay, Gregor, can you just unmute yourself? Yes, I am unmuted. Okay, thank you. Uh, so to continue, uh, we developed uh, uh, specifications for packaging geodata, uh, which is very useful if you want to have the same format for packaging to move the data around. Uh, however, this gives us a disadvantage with, with companies that already have their own uh, packaging formats, but they can still use the content information type uh, specifications, which are solution agnostic. So for us, it doesn't really matter how the data is packaged on the outside. Uh, in this specification, we describe how the specification, uh, how, how the data should be put together within the package. Um, and uh, the geodata specifications that are currently available are the GeoCITS, uh, or as they call called GeoCITS, uh, which you can access on this link below. Uh, and let me say the letter sizes are important in this link. Uh, so in the GeoCITS, uh, we describe how you should store the data itself and the elements that they are used uh, with. Uh, we are currently also developing uh, specifications on how to store uh, parameters of GIS systems so that we can replicate the two informational products uh, that are currently created in these systems. And of course, uh, we also are creating the implementation guidelines uh, for you to use if you want to implement uh, uh, archival of digital uh, geodata. Let me explain the idea of preserving the informational product. So the main idea in the archives is that we store uh, the information that is provided to the public by the uh, organizations. Uh, and to do that, we need to first store the data, and then we need to store the ways the data was used so that we can replicate, let's say, a building permit or something like that. Uh, so. In the first specification, GeoCITS specification, we focused mostly on how to store the data. On the next one, we will focus on how to store the logic behind it so that we can actually see something on the screen. So uh, we will focus on organization queries, uh, so how <coughs> in, the, uh, in, in the project, uh, what queries were used, what geographic projections, what transformation were used, what symbology was used to create a map, which processing, uh, geoprocessing tools and workflows were used, uh, and how they were exported to actually end products as a list or as maps and so on. Now, to give you an idea uh, why this is important is uh, this slide, where you can see that uh, in order to produce a map, let's say this is a map of uh, hospital availability to different locations, uh, which might be a very interesting topic right now. Uh, in order to produce that, we only had the data in the blue uh, blue uh, parts on the left. And in order to actually get an end result, we needed to use this process uh, to manipulate the data to get the results of analysis. So storing data is not enough, okay? The next idea, uh, that we need to figure out is how to preserve complex systems. Uh, if we mentioned the building permit previously, in Slovenia, for instance, we need to access the limitation areas from different ministries, which all have different uh, GIS systems. So in order to archive the decision that was made that you can, can or cannot build on certain location, uh, needs to be accessed through all these six systems. And in this uh, current state of the systems, they do not provide the possibility to go back in time and see what exact uh, data was published on the certain date in the past. So these are also some guidelines that we are creating to, to do now. Uh, just to see how things get complicated with time. Now, to explain 
the specification package uh, for geodata itself, which is currently available, I would use this story of a friend of mine who actually wanted to uh, repair an old uh, landline phone. Uh, this is a phone that was very popular in the 80s in Slovenia. It has a nice design, and uh, uh, this guy is an electrotechnician, which is uh, uh, working with the old gadgets. So he wanted to reuse this uh, after, let's say, 30 years. Uh, and in order to do that, uh, he first needed to analyze what type of phone this was, and on the back, we had some metadata for this phone. Uh, like we had the year of build, we had the serial number, we had uh, some ideas about awards, which company made it, uh, where it was made, and so on, uh, what specification it is uh, tested by. Uh, then the next thing is we opened the phone and we saw that in this phone, uh, there's a lot of technical stuff. We have some a keyboard, uh, a motherboard, uh, we have some uh, speakers, some dials, and so on, some cables. Uh, but in order to actually repair this, we need some technical documentation. But the people in this company were obviously very, very um, future-oriented, uh, so they uh, included a technical schema into the phone. So this is the technical documentation we would need to actually repair the phone for the future. And this is a good example of a package where you can actually see the technical information, how uh, data was used, and what uh, uh, technical um, guidelines were there to actually make it work. So this is a metaphor for us creating a geospatial package. Uh, and this is an example of the geoinformation package example, where we, as well, we create the data, uh, where we have a geodata folder. And uh, in the geodata folder, we actually have the original representation, which is sort of like a golden copy of the format we used. But we also need to include the long-term preservation format. Because in 20, 30, or 40 years, we might not be able to access shapefiles uh, or DBF files or something like that. So uh, we used uh, a GML format, which is uh, standardized. Uh, it, it's an ISO standard, and it's a uh, text-based format, uh, which is also machine-readable. And it's very good for transformation uh, to other formats. And aside to that, we also uh, included some technical documentation uh, which, with visualization examples and so on, just like we had in that phone. And to add to this, we also recommend that we add some additional documentation about the context. So the project uh, report, maybe an interview with the person and so on, to get a broader context of how this data was used. Now, this is not exactly uh, machine readable in all aspects, but it gives us a guideline uh, into the direction that we need to go. So that's why we also have the metadata in machine-readable form that helps us uh, create the information uh, for the search engines and uh, help us. It, it helps us uh, search for the data within the vast uh, loads of data in the archives. And again, uh, please go to this link. Uh, Check the specification on our GitHub. It is within the specification folder in PDF format. I would encourage you to download it, uh, to read it, uh, and give us some comments, some feedback, uh, so that we can make it better for you. Now, uh, I will not go into greater depths about this, uh, about this uh, specification in this presentation, because we already uh, have videos online on YouTube. Uh, about the air archiving specifications and tools to use them. So I please encourage you to go to this link. And if you still want to know more about how to choose a long-term preservation format, you can also see a lecture from uh, Geospatial Preservation Conference on the link uh, in this slide. I guess that uh, all the slides will be available after the webinar uh, for download from the page where you actually accessed it, so you can see the links uh, later on. Now, to conclude the part about the use of specification, I believe that uh, we showed that the benefits of geodata CITS specifications are that they are based on community standards. Uh, on OGC, which is the OpenGIS consortium uh, standard body for geodata specifications and ISO standards, uh, we're also recommending human and machine readable formats, uh, which are created so that uh, we can 
offer uh, services for the future users, which are uh, going to be increasingly more automated. Uh, we also provided some examples for packages of different data types, like vector and raster. And uh, because it is uh, solution agnostic, it is applicable in most archival solutions. Okay. So if we saw what uh, solutions we have uh, for the organization types we want to serve, we now need to know how to implement this. And this is what the guidelines uh, will actually include some strategies for implementing an accessible geospatial records archive. Now, why do I say accessible? Because currently the archives things are still uh, made the old-fashioned way. The speed is not important, but if you want to serve the economy, we need to make it uh, machine-readable, service-oriented, uh, accessible through the web uh, without the need to go to the location. Of course, we're talking about the data that is uh, that has no access restrictions. Uh, the data with the access rest restrictions will still need to be accessed on site with special permissions. Okay, so in order to actually think about the strategies, uh, we started looking at the challenges that different types of users of these specifications have. And based on our experience from the Slovenian National Archives, the International Archives, uh, some several mapping agencies uh, and solution providers, we saw that the geodata producers who need to store the data uh, lack the preservation expertise. So that they actually think that if they put the backup on a CD drive or a DVD drive and put it in a drawer, that's good enough and it can be there for 20, 30 years. And the archivists know that this is not the case. So they are not aware of the, the, the magnitude of things we need to do to actually preserve things in a proper way. Uh, so they also think that the archiving is an additional work for their staff. It costs additional money. They don't need it. Uh, and they actually don't know which formats to use. So this is where we want to help them uh, by creating these guidelines and also by telling you how to connect with the knowledge from the archives. Because the archives are the second group of people who will be faced with archiving geospatial data in the end. Uh, and mostly, ordinary historian does not understand complex digital systems. So the archives need to, uh, to start uh, developing assets or start uh, employing people who have this additional knowledge. Uh, and also, we need to adjust our guidelines on storage, on archival uh, storage of data, because digital is not paper. So in most countries, 30 years is too long for us to give the data to the archives. Because can you imagine what types of files you used 30 years ago for a uh, word processor or uh, Excel type spreadsheets? You couldn't open them now. Uh, and also, there's a lack of motivation from the side of producers because they don't know why they should do that. Or if they have to, it's just a legal obligation. So this is where uh, we recommended uh, some common uh, events are being created like the Geopreservation Conference where uh, that we had last year to somehow engage these two communities together uh, in order to help them get along and see how things can, get, can be done easier. Uh, the archives also don't have the experts they need to actually manage and interpret interpret the uh, geodata systems, and they also have questions what formats to use. Now, the solution providers uh, actually uh, mostly ask us, will this require us to change our data model, and how much will this cost? So we are giving some ideas on uh, how to approach this issue uh, in the most uh, elegant way. And of course, uh, to see what formats to use, uh, look at our specification and look at the webinar uh, that I gave you the link to, to get an idea how to choose the proper formats for that. So now we can see that uh, the role of the archive in the digital age are changing. Uh, previously, we were just uh, giving data to the archives, that, like when this is where the data goes to die. Uh, but now this, are, this is changing and we need to start focusing on uh, 
thinking about the future, how the data will come together. So to bridge the gap, we will still need to archive ex a lot of existing th systems who are not uh, ready uh, for, for the archivation part. Uh, so we need to do, do it the slow and painful way. Uh, but on the other hand, we need to start thinking about uh, proactive preservation in new systems. And this is where we recommend this following strategy. So in the geodata lifecycle, uh, we capture the data, we manipulate it, we analyze it, and this is where the production actually produces uh, something useful that we want to distribute to our users. And that's where we should add a preservation step. A preservation step in which before we add the data to the distribution channel, uh, to web services, to our download pages, uh, we create a time snapshot. In this time snapshot, we convert the data into long-term preservation format, as it is described in the specifications. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we copy the data to a long-term medium. We storage it securely. We add the metadata and the documentation, export to archival repository, and of course, deploy to archives every five to 10 years. Because this would give us uh, a safe uh, time period so that we can still manage and change the formats uh, in the archives is, if needed. So this is what the uh, geodata producers, uh, uh, solution providers should think about when they're working with new geodata uh, systems and uh, with existing geodata systems. And for the archives, we have, uh, if you're starting from scratch, the strategy, the strategy to actually implement geodata archiving is to first identify who has the, the archival data. And the first idea is, of course, the mapping agency, the national mapping agency, the agencies who produce the base maps, like satellite or aerial imagery, uh, topographic maps, uh, cadastral maps, and so on, and start with that. And why is this important? Uh, this is important because if you start with, like in Slovenia, we started with the Ministry of Culture, and they have these uh, areas of cultural heritage that are based on cadastral maps. So if we don't have the cadastral maps in the archive already, we need to store the uh, heritage areas together with the archival uh, uh, cadastral maps, uh, so, and by that duplicating the amount of cadastral maps in the storage, where, when there could actually be communication between the dis different funds uh, from different locations. Uh, so, The first step would actually be to uh, start working with the mapping agencies uh, and to actually build, a, build a, uh, a relationship with them because they have the knowledge about the geodata, they know how to handle it, how to interpret it, and you know the, arch the archives, you know how to actually preserve it and make it uh, available so that it is authentic and uh, it can be uh, available for a long time. Uh, we encourage you to gather the documentation in the existing systems, uh, maybe interview some people who actually were uh, working with, uh, uh, with the data and then package and archive it in the most efficient way. And I saw someone asking about uh, specifications for, for formats. Yes, we recommend the formats in the specifications. So please do download it and uh, give us some feedback. Now, this picture actually shows the OIS process within the archive. Uh, and I created this for all the people from the archives that are actually using the OIS uh, process. So before we spoke about the pre-ingest process, how to work with the producers, which data to use. And now let me tell you what you need to do in the archives to actually apply geodata, uh, digital geodata archiving. In the ingest step, you need to have uh, tools and knowledge how to um, validate the geodata, how to reuse it uh, in a similar way to create a temporary DIP. Uh, and then you need to uh, think about uh, tools that you will use to, uh, ma to do the mass conversions when the data uh, formats become obsolete in a couple of years. Uh, and the last step is to make it accessible uh, through a web service uh, or web service-oriented architecture where we uh, publish the geodata metadata and uh, the archival metadata to a 
uh, search engine uh, that enables us to access the records uh, through a web service application platform that can be installed either within the archives or it can be installed uh, or it can be hosted at the Nets, uh, National Mapping Agency, for instance. So there are many ways to uh, approach this step uh, and we, start, we need to start working together uh, with the um, uh, different stakeholders in this process. Because if you see, we're not talking about uh, archives being the place where data goes to die. This is actually a recycling of geodata. Uh, so we need to be part of the uh, data lifecycle process from the beginning to end and then starting at the beginning again. So the archives will need to engage with the future of data uh, collection and uh, uh, data producers will need to engage with the ways to archive and recycle the data. Tu peux utiliser aussi le mot gay, ça te le rappelle, OK? Um, so the next strategy that uh, comes to mind is that uh, we usually have a data repository strategy for geodata, which is very complex uh, to manage and to, uh, to actually distribute and uh, interpret. And basically the archives used to do it in a way that the producer uh, exports the data from their original system, it transfers the data to the archive and the archives actually work on that uh, uh, data and store it and manage it and take care of it for the long term. However, in this case, we saw that the archives usually lack the expertise from geodata, and it's uh, often not uh, possible to actually get such experts for such a small amount of data. Uh, so we recommend that the archives connect with the producers who are, let's say, uh, have more expertise, like national mapping agencies maybe, uh, and uh, they can discuss either to, to, to take the first step uh, or, or the, uh, the first approach or the second approach where they advise to the producer on the preservation strategies uh, so that the producer creates their own archive which they can manage and inter interpret uh, in their location. So these are the two strategies that you can use to actually uh, still ensure that the data is protected, the data is uh, uh, stored properly and does not go to waste. Because for instance, uh, in Slovenia we had an example where uh, the mapping agency scanned 72,000 maps of cadastro maps and put them on tapes in, TA, uh, uh, in TIFF formats and they, put, they left them on tapes for 15 years uh, without rewinding the tapes, without doing the proper uh, preservation uh, actions to those tapes and now those tapes are actually uh, unreadable. Uh, most of them are unreadable, some of them still are, but a lot of efforts were lost. So uh, this is where the producers and the archives need to work together. So for the archives to get an idea of what types of GS users there are, uh, here are just some of the user types that use geodata in their daily work, like public offices for environment, agriculture, transport, defense, disaster response, tourism, epidemiology. And of course, a lot of, uh, a lot of companies for electricity, gas, water, sewage, telecom, logistics, waste management, they also use uh, geodata for their location uh, management. And of course, there are also a lot of institutes and agencies in the countries that uh, use this data, like forestry, fishing, geology, uh, water management agencies, uh, uh, institutes working with economics, health, because also the public health happens somewhere. We all know the maps, uh, that are showing us the COVID-19 uh, outbreaks in the, across the world. And this is where we see that uh, also health uh, profession uses maps for that, and also on the small, uh, lower level. So this is where I conclude my recommendations on uh, uh, strategies to implement geodata preservation, uh, and where I invite you to help us help you. So please download the GeoCITS documentation and tell us uh, if there's anything else you need us to clarify. Are, there, uh, are we covering your needs? Do you have any other questions? Did we forget anything? Do you have any suggestions? And because we're tra developing training within this project, uh, we would like to know what type of training and consulting you would need. Because we can offer online training or on-site training uh, 
from the resources from our consortium. Uh, we can also offer consulting to the uh, people who would like to implement these data uh, specifications and tools. Uh, we can offer uh, solutions for that. So uh, tell us what you actually need. Because when we are going to develop uh, implementation guidelines, we need to develop it for you. We need to develop it for people uh, who have questions uh, so that we can answer those questions. And uh, if we're talking about questions, um, this is where I come to the end of my presentation.